Well, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Today uh, is part three of a three-part discussion with Dr. Brandon Rickabaugh. We've been talking philosophy of mind, and in particular, his own uh, addition to the field, uh, specifically on um, phenomenal the unity of phenomenal consciousness. And so if you haven't yet, go go back and listen to part one and part two. Um, uh, if you want to keep listening right now, or if you already have, uh, Dr. Rickabaugh uh, is going to kind of catch us up to where we're at. It was a lot, though, so he's not, he's not going to be able to do it full justice. And then today, uh, we're going to be jumping in. Uh, we, we talked about uh, physicalism, but we're going to be talking about emergentism and um, panpsychism. So without further ado... Brandon, thanks for for coming on the podcast yet again, man. Yeah, thank thanks for having me, being interested in this stuff, Parker. Yeah, it's so good. It's yeah, intimidating. It's intimidating um, because your mustache <laughs> has this this sort of it's a thing of terrifying beauty. <laughs> I was gonna say and, that about your beard, man. Well, uh, you know, it's just it's not the same. Not well, the and same. and another thing to add, man. I, I talked to I talked to you about this uh, off air, but you have uh, hus roll right there on your wall and is it's yeah. Leibniz, right? Is it Leibniz? Yeah. So I've got, how do you do this? It's hard to do yeah. it. Yeah. So there's Husserl and there's, there's Leibniz. Yeah. Yeah. It's so cool, man. Jesus, Jesus is over there. Oh, there we go. So okay. People, and then he's also up there. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was going to say he's below Husserl. That, that might be saying something weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and dude, you, I wish someday we got to do a virtual tour of your office or something. You got all sorts of cool fidget things. You got a guitar back there. You got, you got brains just randomly pulling into, it looks awesome in there. It's fun. Yeah. And then then I've got an office on campus at Baylor, but not as cool. It's um, it's in a really nice department, but I got the, you know, the, (laughs) the, the, the lower grade office and it's got this giant, like load bearing pole Okay. In it, and it's also like pretty much in front of the door. When you open the door up, it like stands between me <laughs> and where I sit. So that that would be another thing to take a look at. That would be fun. yeah, yeah. It sounds good. I'm I'm hoping someday to hear uh, the the paper about the load bearing pole and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and and how it motivated some new theory of yours. Oh yeah, yeah. That will have to make it in there. Yeah, I'd always yeah. joked about like because uh, philosophers always come up with really malicious thought experiments, mm-hmm. right? An assassin, you know, someone, you know, poisoning someone, someone. Yeah. Scientist, yeah. So I was, when I, at Baylor, I was like, we need to come up with Baylor style counterexamples. Also, cause Alex Proust is like famous for being the counterexample machine where yeah. we would just come up with really nice counterexamples. Um, but it was hard. It was hard to do. So yeah, those so I'll get, I'll try to make a, Baylor style counterexamples about polls and then really kind and loving things. I can't wait. Then you got to come back on. We'll talk about it. It'd be, it'd be great. Started here, folks. You heard it. You heard it here first. <laughs> uh, Brandon, can you catch us up just just briefly uh, on where we're at in your uh, dissertation and your thought in in our conversation here? Yeah. So the thought, the overall overall argument, and I'm turning the dissertation into a book now. It'll, it'll take some time. Um, maybe like maybe another a year. Um, but the overall, overall argument is that there's you can you can you can parse the logical space um, for the ontology of of subjects of consciousness into two categories. So one is going to be what I call subject simplicity, mm-hmm. and this is going to be the view that the subject of consciousness, specifically phenomenally unified consciousness, is not going to have any separable parts excuse me, an inseparable part in its most basic sense is a part that can exist outside of when it's removed from the whole of which it was a part. Inseparable parts are something that a, su- a simple subject can have, but those are parts that can't be removed from the whole of which they're a part. They also have different kinds of relations. Um, and you can go back to the, I think the first um, uh, vi- uh, video that we did to look at the details. This is distinct from the other theory, which I call subject complexity. And on the subject complexity view, subjects of consciousness have um, uh, parts that are separable, separable parts. Mm -hmm. And um, so I wanted to divide these into two. And and, uh, I wanted to make it the case that 
the vast majority, if not all of the naturalist views could be put into one category. And, and it turns out they fit into this subject complexity um, category. And so last time we talked about standard physicalism and how that um, falls into that court category and the problems that it faces. Um, there are, you know, attempts to, to come up with a type of um, simple, you know, a, a subject simplicity view that's consistent with physicalism. Chisholm, you know, sort of flirted with that view. Um, and there are arguments against those. We didn't get to go into those. But then, uh, so the idea is that uh, phenomenal unified consciousness is a, is a state of consciousness that has a multitude of, of phenomenal um, qualities or modes that are all experienced at once. So I can have the experience of, you know, say, you know, I'm at the ocean and I have the, you know, it's early in the morning. I can feel the, the cold sand on my feet. I can smell the, the salt in the ocean. I can feel the breeze on me. I can hear the waves and I can have these um, visual experiences of, you know, being appeared to readily, you know, all these things. And what's happening is that my experience of those is one uh, at once, at one particular time, is a um, genuine whole. It's a, um, it's, it's a, uh, there's not only the, ex the, what it's like to have these experiences, it's what it's like to have these experiences as one totalized whole. Mm -hmm. And, and a genuine whole, like we discussed last time, it, um, is something that can only have uh, separable parts, not inseparable parts. And so what, what uh, distinguishes this, this, any individual phenomenal unified state of consciousness is the, what it's like to have all of these different states at once. Yeah. So you can't remove any one of these states and have um, that state <clears throat> remain this, the same or have the whole remain the same. And so you, you've got this issue, then you've got this, this problem that I want to push, which is it's clear that phenomenally unified states of consciousness are holistically unified. Um, but it's not clear at all how something that has separable parts could be the subject of that, to ha could have that as a whole. So, for example, if you're an, if you're an animalist uh, materialist, you think that a human person is identical to a biological you know, animal, a human animal. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you'd say then is that um, it's the whole animal that's the subject of a phenomenally unified state of consciousness. But the human animal has got all of these disparate parts, mm -hmm. and so it's completely unclear how it is that this phenomenally unified state of consciousness could be had by all of those parts in a unified way. Yeah, and we talked last time about um, how if you stack up the neuroscientific um, evidence that we have, um, both about the aggregation of the parts of the, the co complex aggregation of the brain or the complex aggregation of uh, neural structures and um, uh, um, neural neural events um, or synapses, ion channels, the synaptic vesicles, um, all of these sorts of things. The amount of separable parts is 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 beyond comprehension. Really, you've yeah. got like on average like 100 billion neurons, and those neurons have roughly like 300,000 or so individual parts as well. So the aggregation is huge. How is it that uh, you can have one holistically unified state? that's um, scattered among all of these parts and then in virtue of that be, ex be experienced as one unified whole. Yeah. Um, and so you could have a brain view and then it's just the same problem but with respect to the brain. Yeah. So we talked about the physicalist um, problems there. Uh, you know, and the example there was, the standard sort of example is, um, you know, imagine that you've got, you know, a room full of, I think this is Bill Hasker's version of this argument. Plato did the, you know, imagine that there's five of us and a Trojan horse. Um, it doesn't make sense for um, each of us to have one kind of perceptual state. And then the five of us come together to have some unified experience of them. Mm -hmm. The way Hasker does it, I think is really helpful. He says, well, imagine you've got five individuals and you've got a sentence that has um, five different words in it each person, each individual person knows one and only one word of that sentence. And they also know the word or the word that they know is also not the same as the word that anyone else knows. Mm -hmm. And so you ask the question, 
um, do they know the sentence in virtue of each one knowing one of the words, one and one, of, one only one of the words that's different than the others. And it seems clear that they don't, but that's supposed to be what's being, what's going on um, for any sort of thing that has separable parts, the parts of which are relevant to um, the experience of phenomenally unified consciousness. Yeah. We've got this sentence, which is, which is, you know, analogous to the unified phenomenal state. And then you have its sense modalities dispersed among the parts, the five and the five people. Um, and they're dispersed, dispersed in terms of each one modality goes to each. And now they're disunified. Mm -hmm. It's unclear at all how you could have a holistic state of consciousness, genuinely holistic state of consciousness. That is a conscious state. That's not just merely functionally unified, but holistically unified mm -hmm. be broken up. That that's a problem in itself that we didn't talk about. Mm -hmm. Um, but this other problem is just assume that you could, how is it then that there is this thing um, that has these five individuals as a part that in virtue of those parts, having one of the sense modalities of the phenomenal state, the sentence experiences the sentence as a whole. That's, that's this problem. Right. Well, I, I think it's, it's helpful for me to conceptualize that and um, Hasker's view, as you've uh, put it by thinking of, you know, just putting these five people in a room and and maybe this is part of his thing i don't know but but i just i think in terms of chinese room often because it's, it's yeah. just a helpful hook to hang on so you put all these people in a room and each one has a certain uh word or, or part of a sentence and that would that would be like saying the room understands the sentence the room is conscious uh, fully Good. conscious of the full sentence and it's like Good. that doesn't make any sense at all just because all these people inside there comprise together Good. they they would collectively know it but there's no knowing emerging out there's no conscious thing that is the room is right that, that right yeah i think that's exactly right and that that's how david barnett who's um has a version of this sort of what he calls the simplicity argument the simple argument he's got mm -hmm. a, a really wonderful paper called just called you are simple um and um it, right and he's and he thinks that behind many of the modern thought experiments and philosophy of mind is this issue of simplicity. Mm. He cashes his argument out in just phenomenal consciousness. So it's different than the, the arguments that I'm trying to make, but I think you're right. The, the Chinese room is um, argument is, is, is going to be the same sort of um, issue about consciousness being dispersed mm -hmm. in the chapter on panpsychism. I have this similar sort of thing where it's five aliens you know, and these, you know, they're, they're in isolated chambers. Each of them has one of five parts of a plan to, you know, do something. Well, actually, no, I say they're going to save the planet. So here's a good Baylor counterexample. Yeah, um, there you go. Yeah. Um, uh, and they report to their, e to their evil, their nefarious um, alien overlord, which in the dissertation is named Tim O'Connor. Right. <laughs> so I think I mentioned before, if you can have your, your dissertation committees and advisors uh, um, having either neurological disorders or, <laughs> or being villains, it's a good thing. And so the question is, um, you know, Tim gets the information from the five, and so he's got this sense of what it, of, of what it's like to experience an awareness of the whole plan. But those five aliens don't constitute any anything that has an awareness of the plan. Mm -hmm. uh, even though they're each consciously aware of one of the parts. And that's, that's the panpsychist part is that there is that the each individual, um, the, 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 each individual se separable parts of the whole that's supposed to be conscious um, are individually conscious in some way. Yeah. So that's what's sort of misleading about the, about the way that, that Hasker and Plato and most people put up, put the argument that you've got five different people or something like that, because, on the physicalist story, you don't have five things that are conscious like people. Right. You've got, you know, five non-conscious parts that's that come together to make a brain that's conscious, mm -hmm. right? The panpsychist says, uh, you know, so so the the move here then in this argument, the overall argument that I've got is that okay, well, if physicalism doesn't work, then how can we modify subject complexity? And one way to do that is to say, well, what's wrong with the physicalist view is that the parts aren't conscious mm -hmm. so maybe we just front load consciousness into the universe and now the parts themselves are all conscious yeah and so well, maybe it's easier to, to to sort of have those things that are conscious bind together to form some other thing that's conscious of yeah. the universe. 
That and that that seems like yeah, that might be a smart move. Um, I you show that it's not. But what about um? I, I'm wondering about uh, proto panpsychism. Yeah, how, how would that how how would that fit in if they don't have they don't have consciousness in the different right. uh, aggregates or the right. different parts? Yeah. Right. So I would I would lump that into the emergentism because okay. on the pan proto psychist the view is. It's not that consciousness is ubiquitous ubiquitous in the universe. It's not that fundamental things are conscious like the panpsychist thinks. Um, it's rather that fundamental things, so just think of quarks, atomic symbols, or something like that, um, they're, they're, they have a nature such that when they get grouped together with other things, that, that the things that they get grouped together with, that one thing becomes conscious. Yeah. Okay. And so you could just think about that's just a more that's a more detail a little bit more detailed story about you know how how emergence works. Yeah. Look, you just have these laws that when these particular kinds of things come into contact in virtue of something about them, a conscious a subject of consciousness is formed. Yeah. 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 Well, so okay, so now moving on into into your specific arguments, we already kind of touched <clears throat> on a few, but um, would you rather start with um, like Russellian? panpsychism or or emergentism yeah let's start with with the russellian panpsychism okay the, both of the views uh, you know all of the, all the arguments you know we we're talking to this before we started with are, are you know you've you've read the dissertation so you know that they're you know you know like a dissertation should be maybe too careful or you know maybe maybe overly technical just trying to I mean, you got, so I have Alex Bruce and Tim O'Connor as um, both as dissertation yeah. directors, which is weird. Mm -hmm. And they both have like different kinds of approaches to philosophy and different intuitions. And so it was very much like, ha like having divorced parents <laughs> where like, the rules at dad's house are not the same at mom's yeah. house. So, so I had to satisfy them. unify them and yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the, the detail, the detail that you, that, that I went into is, is too much for an hour long podcast. But I think that the panpsychist stuff is even more complicated than the emergent stuff. So we can start mm -hmm. there and okay. uh, and see, see where we can get from there. Well, so just, just for our listeners um, who might be, you know, a little bit scared right now, pan is all psych, psyche, 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 um, yeah. soul, or, or has come to be known uh, as mind. Right, so, right. Uh, so all mind. So, panpsychism some kind of view that everything is mind yeah everything in yeah every fundamental thing and then the thing and then the things that those fundamental things compose have some level of phenomenal consciousness mm -hmm. so the the thought is you've got to have this really um unique balance where um obviously we have a very sophisticated high level of phenomenal consciousness Mm -hmm. And it does seem really peculiar to think that that an atom has or a quark has the exact same sort of mental life that I do mm -hmm. in the normal sense. And so you have to, you know, you might think to make it more plausible, you've got to diminish the type of phenomenal life experience that, you know, a quark could have. The issue, though, is that if you diminish it too far, then it seems to be at some point you just lose what's interesting about phenomenal consciousness altogether. Hmm. So there's, you know, I want to say that um, it's not like, you know, a Disney or Pixar film where you're going to have these quarks that can do everything, can have all the same experiences that we have. So some yeah, people, have film. You, right, right. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's sort of like, the quark. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like, um, oh, I'm going to forget it now, but that, yeah, that actually would make a really good analogy. That what's that Pixar film with, like, there's different individuals inside of a brain that that represent different sort of emotions. For it doesn't matter. Is anyway. it? Uh, there's one. There's one uh, where the guy's sick. It's I think it's with Bill Murray. And I don't. It's a pill. And it's not that one. I'm I'm a Christian, so I don't watch um, Pixar <laughs> movies. But someone, I don't watch movies at all, except for The Passion of the Christ. There you um, go. And the <laughs> I'm kidding. I it's the only one. I love movies um okay let's get back on to yeah panpsychism <laughs> back to it. A confessional yeah so so i want to be fair in saying um the panpsychist isn't committed to the view that um quarks have the same phenomenal experience that i do 
Right. But they've got to think that the, they've, if the view is going to have any sort of explanatory power or be any different than standard physicalism, it, it's, it's, you know, it's going to say that there's some sort of phenomenal uh, experience that these quarks have. And when they aggregate to form something more complex, presumably the, the phenomenal experience of that thing is a little bit more complex until you get something like a brain or a, a human animal or something like that. And uh, do they talk about like the, the, the type of complexity? So, so like my, I'm looking at a GoPro right now and I'm like, well, that's complex, but does that mean, does that mean that this GoPro would have more phenomenal consciousness than the uh, table outside? Like, because yeah, more, I mean, or just the aggregation of more, more quarks. If the aggregation is relevant to um, phenomenal consciousness. Okay. Because you could just, you know, so it's going to be the sort of aggregation that is in somehow causally or um, constitutively, you know, in some way relevant to um, consciousness. And the, and the sort of more consciousness that we're thinking of is um, in terms of quality. Okay. It, that it has a more, uh, the, 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 the sort of qualities that a phenomenal state has become more and more complex. Okay. Because right. other, yeah, otherwise the sun would be like this giant thing that, that this huge amount of phenomenal consciousness. Yeah, yeah, and maybe and maybe it does, and we just don't you know understand. Yeah, it can express it's itself, like. or maybe it does when it sends out uh, those big yeah. rays or whatever that come back at us. Right, so you could have like skeptical panpsychism, which is sort of like skeptical theism, and we just can't understand the reasons of the sun. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. There's a paper to write there. Right. Yeah, you heard it here again first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it'd be a good one, but it's yeah. a paper. Yeah, so panpsychism comes in a variety of various views. Um, and, and one of the people that sort of revised, so panpsychism is a really, really old view. It goes back to pre Socratic philosophers. Hmm. But in the contemporary discussion, one of the people, one of the philosophers, or two, the two main philosophers, I'd say, that have given that are responsible for, for maybe the resurgence of interest in this view um, are um, Galen Strawson mm -hmm. um, and David Chalmers. And David Chalmers splits his credence, but you know, 50-50 basically between substance dualism and panpsychism, and particularly a constitutive form of panpsychism. And he and, and others that are attracted to panpsychism or those who work on it think that the most plausible form is constitutive um, panpsychism. So on this view, you know, I'll just here's the here's the the specific definition that that um, that's given is that um, according to constitutive panpsychism, facts about consciousness at the macro physical level, so at the level of you and I, are not fundamental. Um, but are wholly or partly grounded or realized in or constituted of facts about the fun, uh, about the fundamental macro conscious level of consciousness. So that is um, the states of consciousness at the macro level that have to do with the URI. Those aren't fundamental, mm -hmm. but the facts about these phenomenal states that we have are grounded in, realized or constituted of facts at the fundamental level. And those facts at the fundamental level are micro states of consciousness. And so it, I, I may have missed it just now. Is that a, like a supervenience theory? Or is it committed it's not to? a supervenience theory. It's a constitution theory. So it's okay. it's not merely just if it's not going to be that the, the macro level is the supervenient and the micro is the subvenient such that mm -hmm. if there's going to be a consciousness, a change in consciousness at the um, macro, it has to happen in virtue of the micro. Um, that's that would be a that would be a different thesis because presumably, if some mac there's a macro subject of consciousness, it may become um, it may may take on a life of its of its own, even though the facts about it being consciousness are grounded in facts about its micro subjects. And that would be like maybe William Hasker's view. So on Hasker's view, he's got what's what he, what's called emergent substance dualism. So on this, but you're right, yeah. So what happens is is you get this um, aggregation of physical parts, um, or purely physical parts, and once they get aggregated in the right way, these emergent laws kick in, kick in, and you get this completely new substance okay. that has all these new properties too, and it's a soul. 
yeah. a material soul that's simple and has these particular properties of free will and consciousness. Okay. And that thing, um, although it's still tied to and, and causally dependent on uh, brain states, and, you know, for example, there is a way that the soul acts um, with authority and autonomously in certain ways over the brain. Yeah. So yeah. There's that, that, that's, that's a good way to put it. But on Hasker's view, it's specifically, it's a substance, not a set of okay. properties that emerge. Yeah. Okay. So then uh, back to, to the constitution view, I'm, I'm not sure what work is being done in, right. in them saying the micro, the, the macro and micro relation there. Right. So it's that the micro facts um, combined in some way that explains why the macro, why, why a subject like you and I are conscious. Okay. So it, the physicist wants to say, why am I conscious? Well, it has to do something with the function of the non-conscious parts. Yeah. The, and, the and, panpsychist wants to say, well, it's something about the parts that are conscious that combined in a particular yeah. way to make me conscious. Okay. Okay. That's the constitutive element. You have like emergent ver versions of panpsychism where it's just when the conscious parts get together, some new thing emerges. Okay. But the main, but the main, um, the main view with, that that's defended is this constitutive view. You okay, combine, guess, combine I, that, that, together of the small psych phenomenal things that are phenomenally consciousness, and, and you get this big yeah. one. I think the, the coin finally dropped for me because I, I always had a hard time understanding because everything seemed like emergentism to me. But in emergentism, there's a new thing popping up like like wetness in, in versus, you know, molecule, molecules not being wet. But in panpsychism, it's not a new thing. It's just a more developed thing because the, the micro things are already conscious. It's just... A, a, yeah, a so you, kind of yeah. So you have a different kind of consciousness that comes out of the combination of the parts. Yeah. The emergentist doesn't say that it's the combination of the parts that brings about a new thing. It's the combination of the parts plus um, these laws ah. that govern the combina that, that something new comes into existence when there's this combination of parts. Do, are the laws themselves emergent? Maybe, maybe well, it depends on yeah, so they're going to be yeah so it, it depends on the level of emergence um on the strong emergentist view there will be new emergent laws that come into existence at new levels of emergence okay so you'll get new laws and new properties at a particular level and then when they aggregate in the right way you can get you know maybe it goes beyond mental properties and there are these these new laws that um, give you a mental substance perhaps okay um, this, this, I hope this doesn't take us too far away or anything. Can you situate like, um, property dualism in, in the three views? Like, can you yeah. be a property dualist and be any one of those or anyone like a panpsychist or an emergentist? Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. Um, so the, the properties are just going, yeah. So you're going to have a distinction between physical properties and non-physical properties or mental properties and non-mental properties. But in panpsychism, Aren't the aren't the aren't the um, quarks? They, they're physical properties, but they're also non-physical properties. Is that is that what's going on there? On so it, we we got to be careful. And Van and Wagen's really helpful here when he talks about physical or non-physical or mental or non-mental properties. Um, it's not going to be the case that you've got like what well, the substance dualist thinks. You've got these two worlds. And they're and you're gonna have these things that are non-physical, and they have qualities that are just different than physical the things that physical qualities have mm -hmm. the property dualist can just say look that there are these physical properties and non-physical properties um, or mental properties and non-mental properties and something that's totally 100 percent completely physical um, is conscious in virtue of having a mental property mm. so it's not that when it gets a mental property it becomes this thing that's not a physical thing anymore yeah it's just that there are different kinds of properties, and presumably, what distinguishes them is that in order that, that in order to have mental states, you have to have these new kind of properties, these mental properties, that are not reducible to physical properties. Okay. So that's that's going to be the property dualist um, thesis. There, you've got these properties are things that are sui generis. They're they can't be um, you can't account for the facts about 
mental properties by reducing them to facts about physical or non-mental yeah. properties. Okay. I like, I like that. I think that's pretty cool, but I, I'm not, I don't see how, how an emergentist can, can say that because yeah. it's, yeah, it's yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So, you know, it, it depends really. So if you're a theist for, so, so for example, there's two different, two main views about how souls come into existence. Mm -hmm. And the creationist view and the traducian view, and I think they're actually not different views. Hmm. I think the only that I think that what you've got going on in both views are laws that are divine that are divinely put into the world that govern when a soul comes into existence. Um, I don't so I don't think there's actually very much difference. But the idea there is that God has just sort of made this promise, you know, imbued this law that whenever. Um, you know, a, um, you know, a, whenever there is a sperm and egg that are conjoined, a soul comes into existence or mm -hmm. something like that. I think, uh, I, I think you, it, it, it also depends on how you parse, uh, like laws. Some, some people would say, well, law is a promise. Others are like, no, it's, it's God's active role. He's still making the wind, uh, the trees uh, blow because of the wind, because he's still active. Right. So, so there's, but I like what you said because like means and ends, right? So God does create every soul whether he does yeah. it through natural means of him upholding and his, his, um, his providential work or whether he's actively doing it. One of, one of those might be more difficult than the other, if, d depending on how you parse that. But yeah, I, yeah. I like what yeah. you said. There's going to be a differences of laws, whether or not the laws have to do strictly with um, the, the sort of biological components or whether or not they're just more they're They don't have anything to do with those right. biological components. And God has just said when they come together, bam, you're going to get a soul. Yeah. So that doesn't seem to be as problematic as a naturalist, because what is accounting for the emergence of um, a soul, for example, is something that's outside of um, the, you know, uh, the causal system of the universe or something. It requires God's activity to bring that in. Yeah. The naturalist is, doesn't have that um, uh, story to tell. And so what it means for there to be emergent laws seems is, is, is not given an explanation like the theist gets this excuse me personal explanation for that the mechanistic explanation that the naturalist can give in in so far as i understand it doesn't make emergence um explanatorily powerful it seems to just make emergence a restatement of the problem yeah yeah you'd mentioned that before that makes sense yeah, you know, in, the same, in the same like this before too in the same way that kim you know argued that supervenience is just it's not a solution to mental causation. It's just a restatement of the problem of mental causation. Yeah. Oh, that's good. So, 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 um, so maybe, well, why do you term, um, or why do you, why do you pick on, uh, Russellian or Ru Russellian, uh, panpsychism? Yeah. yeah. So, so like constitutive panpsychism, um, is the most famous uh, form or not famous the most plausible form is that um, it's the, the even more plausible, I would say, um, defended form conjoins that thesis constituent of panpsychism with with Russellian monism, mm. right? And the Russellian monist, and this is you know co that, term, that name coined after um, Bertrand Russell, um, has th at least th commitments to three specific claims. So the Russellian monist is committed to what you can call um, structuralism about physics. Mm -hmm. They're going to be committed to realism about what, what are called quiddities. I think that's how people say it. And then they are also going to be, um, they're also going to be committed to the thesis of, I mean, quiddities about consciousness. So what that is, is going to be this, this, um, I'll, I'll read it out of the, of the book here. So, Structuralism about physics. Physics uses only the terms of spatio-temporal structure and dynamics to describe the world, revealing only the relational structure of matter, but not its intrinsic nature. So on this structuralism about physics, physics is blind to the intrinsic features of matter. Or another way to put this is the, the physics, physicists, physics will explain the, um, yeah, the structural or the, um, uh, Oh, I lost lost track here. The um, quantitative features of mm. something, 
but it won't get to the intrinsic features of matter and especially not the qualitative features that have to do with consciousness. And Brandon, is that, would the qualitative features be considered metaphysics? Does yeah. Metaphysics yeah. Feel that? Okay. Um, well, yeah. So yeah, right. So if you, um, and what we mean by that is going to be it. So the, it's going to be the study of metaphysics or philosophy of mind or, um, well, I think even more importantly, phenomenology that's going to reveal those features. So yeah. for actually particular, really what it is, is, is that um, introspection reveals those features. Just by experiencing consciousness, we come to be acquainted with the qualities of, that, that consciousness has. It's like the, the use of metaphysics to sort of give, a con uh, give accounts and shape to what those facts that we have a, acquaintance with. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's helpful. I think the the thing that's helped helped me think this way uh, most is C.S. Lewis's essay um, "Meditation in a Tool in a Tool Shed." Meditations in a Tool Shed, and he talks about looking at um, a beam of light and then looking along a beam of light, and it's kind of I think it represents um, Husserl's like Laban's Welt of like the the life world, like the 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 world of meaning and. It's, it's been super helpful to, to think through and say, you know, there's like the third person view and that's the objective and that's what science wants. That's what scientism wants. And they yeah. try to reject that first person view, which I think, you know, guys like Nagel are saying that that can't be done. You cannot do that. Right. So, yeah, good. I have to read. I've not read that that um, Lewis um, essay. That sounds interesting. I'll read yeah, it. Um, but yeah, this distinction between first person and third person um facts is is really really interesting um so i think i i think maybe i i don't know if i mentioned but i'm working on two books one's an introduction to philosophy of mind for ivp academic nice. and another is this really long three-year project that um jp moreland and i have on co-authoring this what we hope to be the most detailed and sophisticated argument uh, book on arguments for substance dualism a mere substance mm. dualism. and i'm doing the one on this the sort of first person indexical Awesome, and, and I have a view that I think is it's it's insofar as I understand so is is somewhat is pretty controversial, but I think is true, and that's to say that I don't think that there actually is a distinction between first person and third person. Hmm. I think that what we have um, are first person and second person modes of experience of uh, explanation, but any explanation that um, any sort of yeah any sort of explanation that someone has any sort of act of, of knowledge is, or experience is always going to be had from the first person. Yes. So anytime I reason through an argument or, you know, look at a set of data that the physicist provides me, I'm always going to have an experience of that data in the first person. That's, that's what C.S. Lewis really makes that point. What's yeah. That? You, you got to read that essay. C.S. Lewis makes that point about, about neuroscientists. Oh, good. How, yeah, yeah. They're, they're looking at brains, but then back behind him, someone else is looking at his brain and it, and it goes back and back and back. And right. there's always consciousness there going on. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So there's a thought experiment in, in the, I can't, I think it's in the panpsychist chapter, you know, you know, on this, imagine that there is this um, neuroscientist um, named uh, Alicia and she gets and, and she's working with this other neuroscientist. Let's say I can't remember who I am, but the name Sasha. And so um, Alicia is hooked up to the fMRI machine and she has a toothache. And so Sasha looks at the outputs of the, the fMRI scan, um, which is really complex. It's, we usually don't recognize we don't we usually don't know this. It's not that the it's not like a telescope that you just sort of look through and you're just seeing what's out there. An fMRI scan has a very sophisticated program that interprets the data. Hmm. So you're getting, you're getting this interpretive model. Um, and actually a huge number of, of um, published um, uh, neuroscientist papers had to be um, removed because it uh, turned out that the program they were using had glitches in it that were... Oh, man. So, so my, my point there is just to say that, you know, we should be a little, we should be, I, I think we should have skepticism so far right now about the quality of the fMRI scans, the data mm -hmm. that comes from them. But let's just suppose that um, this fMRI scan shows what part of the brain, what part of Alicia's brain lights up because she's having a toothache at that moment, mm -hmm. right? It lights up there. Um, and so the neuroscientists might be inclined to think that that region of the brain is what's responsible for the experience of a toothache. 
Now, Sasha can't know that without Alicia's first person report of, yeah, I'm experiencing a toothache. You can't draw these correlations between uh, mental states and, and neural states without yeah. the first person report of the subject. Yeah. And in, in a way of sort of teasing this out, it further is by saying, so imagine now that Sasha is hooked up to the fMRI um, machine and Alicia um, experiences the pain of her toothache at the exact same time uh, that on the screen that Sasha is hooked up to, it lights up in the exact same way that it did when Alicia was hooked up to it and felt the toothache. But there is absolutely no reason for Alicia to think that her experience of her toothache is being represented on the fMRI scan. Yeah. There also is no reason for Alicia to think that Sasha is experiencing a toothache without there being good evidence from Sasha that she is, right? So the best thing that can do, if we have like, you might think like a complete neuroscience is just to say, I, I can't ever tell someone um, what they're feeling. I can just tell them that statistically based on what's lighting up on the screen, that people that are in, that, that are in this physical state experience a toothache. Yeah. There's still this huge divorce between um, the first person experience of, of being in a mental state and then the sort of third person explanation of what's going on in the neural states of someone. Yeah. They really, that's, really do come apart. That's so interesting. So th that's because there's not like a, well, maybe I'm wrong. There's not like a part of the brain that, that deals with toothaches. Is that right? Or is it? I mean, the deals with is, you know, you got to get specific. So there's going to be a part of the brain that at least correlate. And we got to be, we got to be like really specific too on these fMRI. Right. Like usually what's happening in these scans is that they are measuring the presence or lack of, you know, the, the degree to which there is oxygen or blood flow in a particular region of the brain. Okay. So they're, they're not, they don't, they, they, they're not extremely precise yet. Okay. Um, perhaps they will be, but they're not precise yet. So what happens is, is someone experiences a toothache and you notice that this region of the brain has a greater, um, at that point, has a greater presence of blood flow and a greater presence of oxygen, let's say. Yeah. And so the inference that's drawn is that there's this correlation between that part of the brain, you know, lighting up in that way and the experience of a toothache. And the yeah. more and more studies that you get that, the more statistically... Um, uh, probable it is that those that there is a correlation between those those two things. But because of like because of the first person, it could be lighting up for a different reason, or they're not experiencing that toothache pain, even though maybe they they should because their their brain science should be telling that, but they're for whatever reason they're not. Or right, maybe, they right. Were, yeah. Right. That, it reminds me of um, again this will. Let's not go too deep, but there, I, I always forget the dude's name, the guy who, who ran these uh, similar studies about free will, though, and said, you know, push the red button. I forgot his name. Do, do you remember that? Yeah. Leave what it. is it? Leave, leave it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and saying, look, there is no free will because uh, a fraction of a second, whatever, before they hit the button, we knew that they were going to. And then we can do other studies and, and predict what they're going to do. Right. Um, so I can see someone pulling that up as a counter argument saying, no, look, look at this. You know, we, we, we can do, we can, um, we can read someone's mind from their right. brain. Yeah. That, so here's what, so when I look at someone who is wincing in pain, um, my inference and it's a good inference I draw is that they're in pain mm -hmm. because they're exhibiting the physical, the facial, facial or bodily features of someone that I've, you know, that constantly continually reports that they're in pain. And then I also experience having those um, bodily expressions when I'm in pain. Mm -hmm. That is, there are these uh, physical signatures that are present in most experiences of pain. And so I'm rightly justified in concluding that this person is in pain. Yeah. I don't read their mind. There's just mm -hmm. this I mean, on my view, there's a natural sign, but it doesn't have to be a natural sign. There just is this physical signal or sign that tells me that they're in this mental state. That's yeah. no different than what happened, like fundamentally what happens in the fMRI scans. It just is the physical state that I'm looking at isn't represented in, in the body. It's represented in these, you know, very, you know, again, the presence of oxygen yeah. or 
blood flow in a particular region of the brain. Okay. I'm not reading their thoughts. I'm just getting these physical signs that tell me that it's very likely that this person is experiencing this kind of pain, but they don't read my mind. They don't have my experiences yeah. in virtue of that. That's so good because I've, I've heard that uh, like on the Joe Rogan podcast, I've heard that uh, in, in popular culture that we will have, you know, a full uh, uh, neuroscience someday and we'll be able to read each other's minds. And the, the idea of, or, or think of uh, Elon Musk's new project of um, Neuralink. And yeah, yeah, we'll be able to use that to read people's minds. It's crazy. And it's like on the folk level, well, that's science fiction though, dude. That's not philosophy I mean, it's just yeah it, it assumes that that one th it assumes that we're going to bridge the explanatory gap hmm. that we're going to be able to get phenomenal we're going to get phenomenal facts out of physical facts yeah we, well, have, I don't, I don't, we have zero reason to think that that's the case and then when the neuroscientist or the computer scientist gives us evidence for that um, or evidence make the conclusion that we're going to be able to gain the experiences of someone else's mental state they're, they're not dealing with the sort of things that are going to be able to tell us that anyway. They need to give a theory of how you get from the non-physical, how you get from the physical facts to the non-physical facts. Yeah. Yeah. And and again, I, I so like I science. Think if I'm going to be charitable. I'm just going to take it that, that we're sort of lost in translation in some way. What they okay. really mean by mind reading is that, you know, say that you and I can hook up our brains in some particular way, yeah. that you experience uh, a toothache, that the interface that we have can can mess with my neural states such that I also experience a toothache, like say in the same tooth or something. Yeah. That's not mind reading. That's going to be like um, you know one per one person punching us at the same time, so we both experience a two different token instances of the type being the pain associated with being punched in the face. Yeah, There's mind reading going on there. Yeah. Well, there, there's there's a, a whole movement about you know, uh, down, dude. We're going off topic. I'm sorry, but there's there's a downloadable consciousness, or you know, there's there's a this one thing about stacks, and and you put a stack in the back of your brain when you're a kid, and then all of it's like uploaded there, and that's and for me, I'm like, well, I I believe in a soul, so that's not your soul, even if even if you could do that, it's like this this Frankenstein monster of you, uh, if if that were even possible. But there, I've I've heard that conversation a lot. Um, that, that you can download your consciousness. And I think what they mean with the, and the folk level is phenomenal consciousness that you'll be able to re replay someone's memories and stuff like that. Is, right. Is that even conceptually possible? Well, the replacing the memories thing is interesting because um, there is like a, a high degree of correlation between brain states and mental states with respect to memories, even with any sort of experience. Mm -hmm. So what you might be able to do is get rid of some memories from a person if you can isolate the particular neural state that's responsible for particular memories. I mean, that seems like in principle possible, but what you're going to do is just get rid of the physical mechanism that's necessary to have a, to access a particular memory, perhaps. Yes. Well, that sorry, I meant, I meant uh, re replaying, replaying someone's, like I can look and, and watch yeah. your memories from yesterday. Yeah, that, that, oh, oh, yeah, watch my memories from yesterday. So if you could, so in principle, there's, there seems to be, let's see. So if you could just get, what, what you need is this highly sophisticated program that can um, look at my brain and it's correlated with uh, my report about having a particular memory. Yeah. And the, that can be interpreted by this program to give a video display of a representation of that memory that I have. Mm -hmm. um, and it, then what can happen is, well, you can just sort of replay that memory in this, in, in that sense. I mean, if you want to interpretation that, like the fMRI machine, yeah, it wouldn't be actually the memory. Um, another way to think about this is that you can never get into my experience of things. Yeah. Beetle in the You're box. going to be the one having your experience of my oh. conscious life. That's so, interesting too. Yeah, you can't. Your your and this gets into you know sort of the arguments that I give against panpsychism and emergentism is that mental states are are at least in part individuated by the one that has them. Yes. Part of the phenomenal content of my mental state it involves the texture of me having it. 
one of those one of those characteristics is that it's self-presenting to me that also has this phenomenal quality of being a state that's obviously mine is that hexadian be something that's unique to my mental states and individuates them from say yours yeah yeah sorry is, is that is that called hexadian is that well the hexadian is going to be sort of what explains the 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 sort of individual what it is what the individuator is metaphysically okay but, you know that that's a further question you could you know it seems plausible to me to think that a bare particular might do that too okay. um, but these are just the phenomenological um facts about what constitute partly constitute a mental state that individuates them um if whether or not at the bottom like it's a hex 80 that that like truly individuates it my claim is just that there are all th also these other features such that Another person can't ever have my, have my mental state because my what includes um, part of what it means for some part of what it is to have a mental state is that it's a mental state of the subject. Yeah, it's uniquely tied to them. Yeah, it's uniquely tied to me. So you can't have my mental state because my mental state's uniquely tied to me. What you're going to have if you really host a mental state is going to be uniquely tied to you. Yeah, and and that. That, I think that might answer like the the pairing problem. Mm. Is it is it called pairing problem? The, are you thinking about how it is that mental states cause other mental states and cause physical states, or no? Maybe it's a tracking problem. Um, Swinburne talked about in his book about how like because uh, souls are not spatially uh, extended, it's like how is it how is my soul mine and not yours? Oh, right. Right. Yeah. So, or how is it that, um, yeah. How is it that my soul is linked up to my body and not right. yours? Right. Yeah. So you could think, I mean, that you might think that that's, yeah, I'm not sure that would work exactly. Okay. Um, I've not thought about that. So I'm reluctant to really say anything definitive about it, but yeah. Well, um, let's, let's, um, I took it so far off track. Let's try and get back to, to like your, your arguments real quick against, uh, yeah. Brazilian panpsychism. And then maybe if we can hit emergentism. Yeah, good. Because so we've laid some of the some of the groundwork here. So, yeah. so the idea is that if you, um, so the main problem against panpsychism, um, constitutive panpsychism, and in this case, the, the constitutive Russellian panpsychism, is that uh, is what's called the combination problem. Mm. So what you have is you've got this issue about um, it seems. Um, possible that you have a group of fundamental um, physical entities that have phenomenal states that are combined together and still don't have uh, don't become a subject of a phenomenally conscious state yeah so you just get these things together so there's got to be some story that's told about how these things combine together and it seems radically implausible for you to do that and and there's various reasons um, for thinking that the combination problem is usually, um, so here's a statement from William James. It's often used, take a hundred of, uh, of them, fundamental phenomenal states, shuffle them and pack them cl as close together as you can, whatever that may mean. Still each remains the same feeling. It will always was shut in its own skin, windowless, ignorant of what the other feelings are and mean. Mm -hmm. And so, you, so you can't combine these together such that they then form this uh, unified state of phenomenal consciousness. Yeah. And what we really need is something to, to, to sort of explain and give weight to this idea that phenomenal st individual phenomenal states are shut in their own skin or windowless, that okay. they're ignored by the things. And so <laughs> the, 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 the sort of, problem that I develop um, is a type of privacy argument from phenomenal unity um, that, that works, you know, on this. And we've sort of thought about, we've already explained some of the, the working parts here. So the argument here is that um, if um, panpsychism is true, then this thesis of what's called mental sharing is true. So according to mental sh uh, sharing, if constitutive panpsychism is true, then for at least some phenomenal unified states M, if M is a state of a composite subject S, then M is also a state 
of one or more of SS component subjects, S1 through SN. So the idea here is that um, if there is going to, uh, what there's going to be in order for me to be in a mental, a phenomenal unified mental state, I'm going to be in that phenomenal unified mental state um, because I am sharing the mental states of my conscious parts, mm. right? Yeah. So there's going to be these conscious states of my micro parts and call one of those, you know, one of those M1 that I experience and M2 and all these other Ms that I experience, which constitute or combine together to give me my phenomenally unified state. Yeah. That's the idea that, um, that there is a mental sharing going on. Okay. I'm going to have um, the mental, I am going to share in some way the mental lives of my phenomenal parts, my parts yeah. that are, that have phenomenal consciousness. Then there's, so you take that and I, and then I combine, or you take that, which is a consequence of, of panpsychism. And then you take this other thesis that seems extremely plausible called subjectivity for all mental states M, if M is a state of S, some subject S, then necessarily there is a what it's like for S to be in M. Now, if you reject this thesis, then panpsychism isn't like you don't need panpsychism. Yeah. Theories of consciousness, phenomenal consciousness are trying to account for subjectivity. So the panpsychist has to accept this subjectivity thesis and they accept and they have to accept mental sharing. And I want to say in my argument here, this privacy argument, that those two things are in deep conflict. So like, so the simple way to put this here is what I call the privacy problem. Experiences are subjective. Each of us experiences our own mental states as our own. However, if each experience is private, then how can the private experiences of a subject's shareable parts, the micro subjects, make that subject the subject of a phenomenally unified consciousness? Yes. Subjectivity seems to make it the mm -hmm. case that mental sharing is false. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the premises that I have for my argument are just, you know, one, mental sharing is true. Mm -hmm. Two, subjectivity is true. And then three, privacy. And this will be the contentious premise, I take it. For all phenomenal states M, if M1 is a state of some subject S1, then necessarily M1 cannot be a state of any subject other than S1. That's privacy. Yeah. And that is the denial of sharing, the di the denial of mental sharing. So if you have so if you you posit mental sharing, subjectivity has to be true, but if privacy is true, so if if subjectivity and privacy are true, then mental sharing has to be false. Yeah. Uh yeah, so so for all phenomenal states M necessarily M cannot have more than one subject. Yeah. Oh, and if that's the case the mental sharing is false. I really like that, and maybe I'm not getting it. Can I? Can I real quick, just Please, see if yeah. I'm getting it? So yeah, yeah. So to me, um, so on panpsychism, quarks are are quarks subjects? Oh, well, I mean, you don't have to have a wedded quark. Here, let me try this as one more go at it. So there we go. This is this thing that that I use that just you know when I'm stressed or whatever, it just or if I want to zone out and think, you know, you can buy these. I don't remember where this is from, but it's um, imagine that each of these nodes is a particular micro subject of consciousness mm -hmm. and say they're quarks. They don't have to be the, right. the, the panpsychist might think that quarks don't exist, but it's whatever the fundamental the unit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just, um, you know, think of, you know, one of these could be an individual neuron or one of these could be whatever it is, an atomic simple, whatever the fundamental yeah. particles are. Um, these are individual micro subjects of consciousness mm -hmm. and somehow, so let's say that this, uh, this one has the experience one, you know, one kind of experience of a shade of red. This one has one kind of experience of a, of a, a kind of sound and, you know, all these different sorts of phenomenal states. It ha it's somehow the case that when these things combine together, this, this whole, this, this, this one unit here, that's me has a mental state that is what uh, that is a combination or is a is constituted by these other mental states. Yeah. And the way that that's going to have to work out is that I experience the mental life of these individual micro states of consciousness. And my experience of all of them at once is 
an experience of phenomenal unified consciousness. Yeah. And but so, if privacy is true, I can't share any of these mental states. Right. And and that that makes sense to me because yeah, yeah, that's helpful. But. That's good. Well, the the basic units, if they are conscious or they are subjects, um, then yeah, they have their own they have their own experience. Right. Uh, but so they would need to explain why um, the subject me, which is made up of these, can't share my consciousness with you, who is a subject right. on the same level as me, just as these fundamental units are. Are sub are um, the same size or whatever, same so amount. They would, would have to explain how that is possible. I have to explain yeah. how it's not possible. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, they're they're they're, they're um, an entailment of panpsychism is mental sharing. Um, two subjects can be the subject can can share the same mental state, um, and I want to say no, that's that's false. Panpsychism Pride, is committed yeah. to that. Oh, yeah, I, didn't, I guess I didn't. Know. Virtue of these things being uh, being conscious states, yeah, that bind into one state of consciousness. Right. Well, I catch that. Subject. Yeah. But but they they wouldn't be committed to like a mental sharing between you and I, would they? No, no. But but aren't they forced to that view from their fundamental from saying that the fundamental units are conscious and yet can share? Then why right. can't you and I share? Because the com because the combinatorial process. Yeah. Hey, what's up? Hey, come say hi. hi. Come say hi. <laughs> say hi. This is Sawyer. Hey, hey so buddy. The reason why Sawyer, say hi. You're on a show right now. Say <laughs> hi. So the reason why Sawyer's mental life um, uh, or is phenomenally unified for him and not for me is because there are constitutive relations among his micro sub states of consciousness that don't hold between um, okay. the uh, between mine or that don't hold between ours. Yeah, there's no connection there. Yeah. Say goodbye. Say bye. -bye. bye, -bye. See, you, see you later. Go hang out with mama. I'll be out in a little bit. Okay. You want to hang out in here while I do this? All right, that's fine with me. <laughs> um. Uh. Sweet boy, you want to play with this? You want to play with my brain? <laughs> Okay. Um, so does that help explain that? The reason why they're not committed to our brains, our, our, you and I sharing in each other's mental life is because the, the constitution that, that's uh, the constitution, the relationships of constitution between my uh, micro subjects um, are, do not share those are not shared between you and I. But if you if could, were, then, we, then we would. Yeah, you could do that. I guess, like maybe, maybe you logically could do that between like seven different people and connect them, and then an emergent, or I don't want to say emergent, but a mind would, a greater mind would would be unified out of those seven. Yeah. So the reverse of that is what's called cosmopsychism, and that's that. Um, so it reverses the mirological hierarchy that naturalists are typically wedded to, and so it's not a bottom story up. You just stack up the stack up the bits and you get, you know, mm -hmm. consciousness. but it's the reversal of this type of holism. So the universe is as a whole conscious. Yeah. And it's facts about the universe, the facts about the phenomenal life of the universe that ground facts about the mental life of individuals. And that would, and that so would like pantheism. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, you could, it, it would depend on what features you give that universe, but yeah. Right. Interesting. So if, uh, you know, at the fundamental level, it's one field. Then you say, well, the field is conscious. But then you have um, a just the reverse of the combination problem, which is the individuation, or what you could call yeah. the um, decombination problem, which is how is it that, that you get individual mental states that are sealed off in private from this macro, this giant whole conscious yeah. universe? Yeah. Um, so it still it has like the reverse sort of problem. Okay. So, so again, so back to ours, it's that um, if panpsychism is true, then mental sharing is true, mm -hmm. because what what it is that makes a uh, subject of phenomenal unified consciousness what it is, is by sharing in the combination of them. Each individual mental state gets combined in the right way that constitute my mental states. Mm -hmm. So my mental states are a mosaic of these other micro mental states. Yeah. But if privacy is true, 
that's not possible, right? So if, um, if, if what, if, or if, so think about subjectivity. So subjectivity tells us that for any mental state, there is a phenomenally phenomenal state. There's always a, what it's like for me to experience or be in that mental state. Yeah. There's so, so what that tells us is not that there's just a, what it's like to be in that state. There's a, what it's like for me to be in that state. So this goes back to the thesis that we talked about in the first episode, which is subject necessity. And that's that for any mental state M um, necessarily some sub there is a subject of M. Yeah. So you can't have mental states without subjects. Right. Right. So if subjectivity is true, not only can't you have mental states without subjects, but a mental state is going to be partly constitute or is going to have the phenomenal feature of being experienced by a particular subject. Mm -hmm. What it's like for me to experience it. Yeah. For your mental states, there's going to be a, what it's like for you to experience it. So if that's the case, I want to say, if subjectivity is true, then you get privacy that um, for all phenomenal states M, if M1, a particular token instance of a mental state, is a state of S1, a particular subject, then necessarily M1 can't be a state of any other subject but S1. Yeah. But then we need arguments for privacy. And I know we're, we're running low on time. So, yeah. so one reason to think, and I give a, a bunch of these, but the one way to set it up is just to think of um, this, you know, Leibniz's law. So what's, what's it going to be if, if two subjects S1 and S2 share a mental state M, then anything that is true of M when S1 has it is going to be true of M when S2 has it. Mm -hmm. There can't be, um, they're going to have, there can't be something true of M when S1 has it. That's not true of M when S2 has it, if they share the same, if they're both sharing M. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean for us to, you know, so yeah, I hope that, that should be, I think that's, that should be common sense. If you have it, if I have an M that has a fact about it, that's a mental state that has a fact about it, that's different than the mental state that you have, then they're, we're not sharing the same mental state. Yeah. There's no we're, identity. We're, we're not the same token instance. Mm -hmm. We might train the same type, you know, for example, the mental state of a toothache. But yeah. the can panpsychist thesis isn't that um, I share a kind of mental state. It's that, that I share the specific mental state. Yeah, the same token. Yeah, the same token instance. Very, yeah, great. Okay. So all I have to do is is show that, that um, in virtue of S1 having a mental state, there's going to be features of M that can't be true if some other subject has M. Mm. That is for any ment for any so for NT any type of mental state, its token instance by it being a ment a state of mind is going to give it a fact that at least one fact that cannot be true if any other subject has it. Yeah, that's a way to establish that two subjects can't share in the same mental state. Yeah. So a way to do that, there's various arguments that I get, but one way is to just, one way of just to do this is just to argue that mental states are self-presenting. And X is self-presenting if two things hold. First, X is a constituent of a phenomenal state M, and two, X presents itself directly to the subject of M. So my mental state is going to be self-presenting insofar it's a state of my phenomenal consciousness and that that state presents itself directly to me. This is the difference between um, the third person and first person mental states yeah. that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, mental, the mental state, my phenomenal state presents itself directly to me, but it won't to a neuroscientist. Yeah. Um, it'll so it won't present itself directly. Yeah. Part of that presenting itself directly to me includes it being presented to me as a state of mind, as it being a state of mind. And so the way that Husserl could think about this and in Brentano too, is they, they, they have this thesis of dual intentionality, that mental states are about something. Mm -hmm. They have um, an intentional object and um, they're going to have two at least. One is, so imagine that I have, you know, in the, in, in the book, there's a diagram that you got of a person seeing a tree. There, that mental state of, of experiencing a tree is going to have this intentionality that reaches out to the tree. 
but it's also going to have this reflexive aspect of it being me the one who the one that experiences um, the phenomenal state of experiencing the tree. I experience myself being in the state of experiencing the tree. Yeah. I don't just have this sort of bare experience of a tree. I have the experience of me having the experience of the tree. Yeah. I think Kant talked about like the I that's attached to, to every thought. Is that? Is yeah. That what... Yeah. So that's, that's that. Um, yeah. This is in specifically in the mode of um, the self presentation of the intentionality of a mental state. Okay. So yeah. no matter what sort of mental state that I'm in, if it's an intentional state, which, you know, Husserl and others thought that any mental state is, has intentionality. It's going to include in the attentional object um, me as the one who's having it. That's so good. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. you can't have my mental state because my <laughs> mental state has it that I am the subject of it. When yeah. you have yours, you, it will be um, what partly constitute it will be that it has the phenomenal character of you being the one who experiences. Yeah. It's reflexive for me and yours is reflexive for you. Right. And so there's a fact and it's, and it's specific. It's a reflexive for me, qua Brandon. Hmm. It's going to be reflexive for you, qua Parker. Yeah. So the way that, let me see if I can find this, 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 this really good, um, quote, the way that I sort of state it is, you know, look, I, you know, I walk into a room and I don't suddenly get confused about whether or not my mental states are mine or whether or not they are someone else's. Right. So there's this, what I call mindness necessity for all phenomenal states. M, if M is a state of S, then M presents itself to S as necessarily a state of S. Mm -hmm. Try to keep that down, buddy. Thank you. You're doing a great job. Buddy. So, um, yeah, well, that's, I mean, we don't have time to go through all of these. These are all super interesting, but, um, so I, yeah, I go into the ontology of mental states here, ontological analysis of modes. I take mental states to be modes of persons. So that that's to say that, um, a mental state, um, the ontology of a mental state is a, is a mode and a mode, um, includes a, at least one, uh, usually a, a complex set of properties and an excess of exemplification among those properties that is tied to and individuated by the subject. Yeah. So there are no, not only are there not mental states without subjects, but there are um, a mental state um, includes it's being a mode of a subject. So it's not that just that there's this law that says whenever there's a mental state, there's a subject. It's, it's more, it's more detailed. It's that it's that what a mental state is, is a mode that necessarily includes as an ontological constituent of that state of affairs, the subject. Yeah. So there's this mindness necessity. Um, oh, where'd that quote go? Is, is, ah, it doesn't really matter. It was, it was super clever. It wasn't mine, of course, but anyway. So EJ Lowe gives this, you know, John Searle gives these sorts of arguments, but if that's true, then I can't share in the mental life of anybody else. Yeah. Any mental state I have is going to include as part of its phenomenological character, its unique presentation to me as its subject. Yeah. And so if that's the case, then, then panpsych, you know, constituent Russellian panpsychism is, is false. So good, man. That for me, so I'm a theology student initially, like right away, I'm thinking, well, what about like uh, omniscience? And we'll have to, we'll have to talk about that later. Whether God yeah, can know those. Yeah. yeah, so I don't know if you're thinking of Zegzepsky's omni. Yeah, yeah um, omni subjectivity. Yeah, yeah, this would cause a problem for that. Yeah. Yeah, it would cause yeah. a problem. Yeah, that's so that's so interesting. So I don't know. Do we do we have time to, to go through emergence? Yeah, I mean it's up to your listener as to one of that that you want to keep listening. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Going. So again, you know, I want to say, you know, this is an argument in in the chapter there's objections and I deal, deal with those. Mm -hmm. um, so in the, in the chapter on emergence, this, this gets really technical really quick. So I want to do like just a quick and simple version of this. Yeah. The idea is that, so with what, just the, the basic doctrine. Um, yeah. The basic doctrine of emergence is that, um, and, and particularly ontological emergence, there's different kinds of, of emergence, but when I, talk about emergence now. I'm just talking about 
ontological emergence. I just okay. like this guy. This is this guy was actually almost named ontological emergence. <laughs> he looks like it. Yeah. Actually, Sawyer, can you tell them your middle name? What's your middle name? Is it James? Yeah. Who's it after? Well, it comes after Sawyer because your first name's Sawyer. He's, his middle name is after JP. Um, oh, nice. So, anyway, wow. so he's named awesome. ontological emergence. Anyway, so um, so on ont according to ontological mer emergence, it's a thesis that when the parts of any sort of system are arranged in the right way, that typify that system, perhaps their collective arrangement brings something new into existence. Yeah. The ontological. And there are different levels of emergence, what you could call weak emergence and strong emergence. Yeah. And the emergence that we're talking about here is is a strong, strong emergence. So, you know, there's a, John Searle probably gives the most detailed, um, you know, features of this, but what we're thinking about is, you know, what he calls emergence to the arrival of a new entity um, with, you know, with, you know, with consisting of a particular kind of um, mental, you know, uh, substrate, right? Maybe it's emergence one B, but, but what we're talking about here is that something really new comes into existence that isn't merely um, a feature of the arrangement of its parts. It's something which, which, which would be water, right? Water molecules. That's not uh, ontological emergence. Well, so the liquidity is is what he calls emergence one A. That's supposed to be weak. So, you, what you get there are higher level features okay. that result from the causal interactions among the lower level elements. So, if, if liquidity is um, is a is just a causal result of the molecules that are necessary for water, mm -hmm. then it is that's weak emergence. Okay, cool. It's a, merely a causal result. Okay. Um, if you get these sort of new modes of behavior, and these are typified by new emergent causal powers, then you've got you know new emergent laws. Then you've got this strong type of ontological emergence. Okay, cool. And uh, man, you're you're having fun over there, aren't you? Um, so the 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 short argument is that um, if if the emergentist wants to say the subject of phenomenal unified consciousness is some new substance that comes into existence mm -hmm. that's different from the the physical thing like the animal or the um, the brain. That you can play with this, but you got to go do it with Mama and Willow. You want to go do that? Okay. Um, then you're going to have a type of substance dualism. Okay. So if you have this new thing that comes into existence that's addition in addition to the physical thing, a new substance, then you've got a type of substance dualism. Yeah. If it's a physical one, then you're going to deal with the problems that I give in earlier chapters about a physical thing being um, myriologically simple. If it's an immaterial myriologically simple, then you've got substance dualism of the emergent kind. Yeah. Like but, but, but you don't other. like that, right? Like you, you argue against that. Um, yeah, I think that there are problems with it, but, um, you know, there's, there's problems for, for all views. It's just, <laughs> um, I don't, what I don't, what I don't, I'm not persuaded to adopt that thesis because I don't think that emergence gives you explanatory power that a non-emergent theory of substance dualism ha lacks. Mm. That, that's why I would just not find it attractive. So, you know, uh, studying with Tim O'Connor, you know, too, was, you know, he's like one of the main defenders of emergentism. He, I think he softened me up to emergentism. I, I still don't think that it's, plausible but i don't think it's as ridiculous as i used to think it was yeah um so i so i don't I, you know i wouldn't rule it out completely but i think i've got some arguments that diminish the the, the probability of it being true the plausibility okay. of it being true okay so so what i argue then is that if it's not an emergent substance it's going to be a new emergent property right and it's going to have its own causal powers and if you're going to remain a naturalist which emergentists want to then it's then that property is going to be a trope. Okay, it's going to be a particular trope. And so this this what emerges then in order to be a subject of phenomenal unified consciousness is either a single um, subject trope or a bundle of tropes. Mm -hmm. And that <clears throat> that's how I frame um, the the problem here. There, there's there would be other ways that you could frame the sort of problem that I'm that I'm that I'm going to give um, for the emergentist. I'm just giving the um, what's what I would take to be the most likely theory of emergence 
um, that someone's going to try to give for a, a, a subject of phenomenal unified consciousness. Okay. It's going to be a trope because, tr you know, tropes, um, the trope theory is most consistent with, I think, maybe is even entailed by naturalism. So we'll go the, the trope theory. Okay. There are going to be two kinds of tropes, um, thick and thin trope, or there's going to be what are called so this is where, you know, this chapter, the argument of this chapter really makes strong use of Robert Garcia's um, work in this. And he's this brilliant philosopher who actually just came to Baylor after I finished. Um, he's brilliant. And he makes this distinction between module and modifier tropes. And module and modifier tropes can be, th can have a thick character or they can be thickly charactered or thinly charactered. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just stick with the distinction over modifier and module. So a module trope is a primitively singly natural charactered entity. I don't know what that yeah, means. So a module trope has a it can only it has only has one um character mm -hmm. and that character is primitive. Okay. So it can't be, so there's a redness trope and the red just, if it's a module trope, the redness trope won't have any other characteristics other than it being, it, it being naturally care, you know, charactered. Well, real, uh, real quick for, for, for those listening and maybe even for me, we got, we got types and tokens and then right. how does, how does a trope, what, what's a trope? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Trope is a, is a particular token instance. Okay. okay. Um, and so you'll have a red trope um, that, and you can have multiple red tropes and maybe red tropes are what they are in virtue of being a particularization of a type uh, redness. Okay. Cool. Right? Or that they're part of the member of, you know, the red set or something like that. Yeah. Um, it's going to be a way of cashing out the, you know, one version of cashing out the one and the many. So distinguish that to modifier tropes. Mod modifier tropes are non-self-exemplifying, non-shareable character grounder. That is, so the, the, here's the easy way to think about it. The module trope has the character, if it's a red module trope of red, mm -hmm. has that character and that yeah. character only. A modifier trope, so the red trope, if it's a modifier trope, won't have as its character red. Or redness, it'll be the thing that may that is in virtue. So, in virtue of something being red, it'll have a modifier trope. Something that makes it that red. That trope makes it red, but yeah. isn't red itself. Modifies it to be red. It modifies it. Good. Oh. The module trope actually has the characteristic that the thing that uh, that um, in virtue of which the thing that has that is charactered that way. So maybe you just said this, but does a module trope? require a modifier trope no no okay. modifier mo module tropes um are that they're singly charactered they don't have any other character okay cool and if they were to have a modifier trope they would have another character yeah that can't the that. modifier gives it yeah what do modifiers modify modifiers modify the thing that has them so if you hold to a substance attribute theory then the modifier trope is going to modify the substance that has that modifier trope. So an apple has, then a red apple has a modifier trope that makes it red. That, that, that and that, tr that trope is not itself red. Yes, yeah, right. And that's on the assumption that an apple is a substance. So right. on the bundle view, um, the apple is just a bundle of tropes. But those tropes aren't modifier, they're module tropes. Well, they can be. You could oh. think they're module or modifier tropes. Okay, but there's no but, substance. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. So the, yeah, it's a it's a bundle theory of of substance, and so it's going to be the case that either the this bundle, this apple that is a bundle of tropes, is red because it has a module trope that makes it red, and that trope is also red, yeah. or it's going to be a modif it's going to have a modifier trope that makes it red that isn't red itself. But it's a but there but both will be bundle theories that that uh, bundle theory of substance that prioritizes the parts over against the whole. Yeah, good. 
Good. Yeah. Yeah. It's the parts of the bundle that make the bundle what it is. Yep. Cool. Versus the substance making the parts of the substance what they are. Yeah. Good. That's a really mm -hmm. good distinction. So the argument gets more complex in terms of making a distinction between thick and thin characters, but um, I, I argue that phenomenal states have to be thickly charactered. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I'll try to make the argument without using using that. Um, but there, you know, there are three options for the trope theorist. I've already described those. I think either I am a substance, right? That that entails substance dualism, so that's out for the naturalist. Mm -hmm. I am a trope, right? The subject is a trope, so I'm a so the subject, yeah. So the emergent property, the emergent trope of a brain or an animal is this new subject and it's either a single trope mm -hmm. or it's a bundle of tropes. Yeah. And so I, I, so if my argument in order for my argument to run, it's going to have to be, um, I'm going to have to deal with both of those possibilities. Okay. I can't, I'm going to have to say the subject of phenomenal consciousness can't be a trope and the subject of consciousness, phenomenal unified consciousness can't be a bundle of tropes. Yeah. So if it's a, if it's a, one reason to think that I that I the subject of consciousness can't be a simple trope, can't be one trope, is that if it's a modifier trope, then I am a subject of consciousness that doesn't have any phenomenal features. Yeah. Right. And that yeah. that just seems that that I don't know what that means exactly. It's a thing that's conscious without being conscious. Yeah, like philosophical zombie or something. Yeah, yeah, and the zombie's supposed. I mean, yeah, it, but it's worse than that because we're saying it's a philosophical zombie that's conscious. It seems to be contradictory. Yeah, yeah it, sure. So it can't, it can't be a modifier trope. It's got to be a module trope. Mm -hmm. But then the problem here is that go back to the idea that a phenomenally unified state is multiply charactered mm -hmm. or thickly charactered, but a trope. Um, isn't thickly care um, uh, a module trope isn't thickly charactered a module trope only has one characteristic yeah it has to only have one it, ha it can only have one yeah and so that means that i that my in virtue that a subject of phenomenal unified consciousness cannot have a uh, cannot be modified in a way to have multiple uh, to have a, a complex phenomenal state that has multiple features which the bundle theory requires. Well, the, so we're not under the bundle theory yet. We're now okay. on to just the subject is a single trope. Okay. 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 So if, so, it's a, if it's a module trope, then the claim is that it's a subject without the characteristic of being a subject. Yeah. If it's a module trope, the subject is module trope, then it's a thing that has only one characteristic, which seems impossible since being phenomenal, since, um, a phenomenally unified state of consciousness has multiple characteristics. So, and so I'll be, so in, in terms of having the experience, I will be appeared to, you know, readily, loudly, um, you know, all of those different ways that we talked about it. And so you, it can't be a module or a modifier trope or module trope rather, because a module trope only has one character or it doesn't have a character. It's care. It's only, it's thinly charactered. It's singly charactered. Yeah. So, so they're going to so, have to go to bundle theory. Well, I wonder right there though, it sounds like maybe they could say, well, we want phenomenal. Uh, we want the unity of phenomenal consciousness, which is like a singular thing. So why can't a module trope, have the singular thing, which is our singular unified phenomenal consciousness. Well, the phenomenal state has different. Um, so what it, what the reason why it, it, so it is a unity of mm. multiple characteristics. That's good. Yeah. Unity and diversity. Right. Yeah. So that, and that's, that's the, the problem is that it is, it's this holistic unity of multiple features. Yeah. And, and, and these multiple features I argued earlier um, are inseparable parts of one. Yeah, one that's good. That's so good. Character. Yeah. 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 The, the inseparable parts thing is good. And I have to keep remembering that because coming from theology, I'm thinking simplicity and God's divine simplicity. And in, in that conversation, people don't want to say there's any parts even 
yeah, remo- uh, non non removable or divisible, whatever. So yeah, go. okay, so that makes sense. So phenomenal consciousness, the unity of, uh, is a unified thing, but it's it's unified uh, with parts that are what's the phrase again? Not removable. Yeah, w- what is being unified are a multiplicity of um, phenomenal states, which are inseparable parts inseparable. of the state. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So because so, of that. Yeah. Yeah. It can't. It can't be a module, um, because that would be like one. You can have an experience of like just redness, but that's not what we receive in phenomena. Yeah, yeah. the subject it's, would have the characteristic of being appeared to redly, and that's it that alone. But yeah. a comp, but a phenomenal unified state has multiple um, uh, phenomenal it. characteristics. Yes, dude, I'm getting it. This yeah. is good. 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 <laughs> Um, yeah, so so then we're left with the bundle theory, right? So what's going what's going to be you know the problem there? I'm going to say it's going to be a privacy problem there. Okay. So you've got then according to the bundle theory, if the bundle is um, so the subject of consciousness here is an emergent bundle of tropes that um that cut that are that are tied to the brain or the the animal or whatever physicalist theory you want you want to posit um naturalist theory you 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 want to posit um what's going to happen is that you're going to have in that bundle various tropes that are mental states that are components of the whole phenomenally unified state Mm-hmm. That makes that and that um, the conscious bundle has. Yeah. So then you're just going to have the same sort of privacy problem, that the bundle is going to be something um, that uh, is a that that has a phenomenal unified state in virtue of individual micro tropes, phenomenal tropes combining in one. Yeah combination is going to be that, that that the whole thing is going to have a complex state by sharing by having the individual um tropes yeah so so if again so the problem is you know and it gets it's going to be worse depending on which theory or it's going to be bad on any theory there so if you end up having it the case that it's um so let me let me look at this to make sure i haven't i haven't thought about so so uh, the pheno- so a phenomenal modifier trope of some subject can't modify that subject in virtue of the trope being primitively appeared to in one way. So the phenomenal content of a modifier trope, for example, being appeared to or being primitively appeared to readily can't modify anything in virtue of its being primitively appeared to readily. Mm-hmm. So um, a modif- modifier trope couldn't produce a mental state in S that is numerically distinct, but exactly similar similar to the state of the trope, because no two um, subjects can have um, can have exactly um, fin- sim- uh, f- uh, similar um, phenomenal states. Okay. Right. So if you've got this modifier trope that has being appeared to readily um, for that for that trope, the bundle of it can't have that trait because it'll require sharing in the mental life, the, the um, primitively appearing to readily of the trope that, that, that has, that has that. Yeah. Just think the trope has its own primitive, primitively characterized phenomenal state can't make or modify the whole bundle to have that state because then you have two things that have that state. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. And two subjects can't have the same mental state. Yeah trope or not dang okay right so that's that's um so yeah so yeah i'm trying to make sure that uh yeah so that that's the the basic idea there so what if there are modifier tropes though so a modifier trope of some subject s will not themselves that modifier trope won't have any primitive um, phenomenal character. It won't be primitively singly charactered. So a trope, yeah, the, the trope that makes it the case that the bundle 
it has the phenomenal prop or it has part of their phenomenally unified state of consciousness being appeared to readily that trope itself as a modifier trope won't have won't be um, appeared too readily. It won't have that phenomenal feature. It just is the thing that, in virtue of the bundle having it, makes it have the feature of being fun, uh, having being appeared too readily. Yeah. So again, it's think of it as it's you know a thing. It's a the thing that makes something red without being red. Right. Here though, it's the thing that makes something um, have the phenomenal state of being appeared too readily without itself having. Mm -hmm. The, yeah, being having the mental state of being appeared too readily. Yeah. So, subject of bundle of tropes. I say it isn't clear at all what these tropes modify. It isn't clear that there is a subject to be modified as a single phenomenal unity. And mm -hmm. the and uh, the way I work this out is in terms of different types of uh, um, network. Um, uh, topologies, different ways that you could have particular relations that stand between the different tropes in a bundle, right? So you have different topologies, ring topologies, star topologies, um, fully connected topologies. These are these are these topologies are used in computer um, uh, uh, program, computer science um, ways of building networks. Um, the, the, the idea here is that. Um, so, for example, on the ring modifier trope, it's going to say that, or a ring bundle, it's going to say that the subject S, the bundle, is a subject of a, pheno a phenomenally unified state of consciousness at a particular time T if two things obtain. One, S is a bundle of modifier tropes. Mm -hmm. Two, S is constituted by each modifier trope of E at some time T. Okay. okay. So... Um, so I say that there are in a um, that they are in a ring is intended only to illustrate that they are not modifying each other. They're okay. not present. What they do are they're modifying the the whole thing. So yeah. I, the whole bundle. So what I want to argue is that the, the account doesn't work because um, having modifier tropes, the sense modalities of a unified phenomenal state E don't suffice for S being the subject of a phenomenally unified state of consciousness, E. So I say that being a subject of phenomenal unity is not reducible to S being the subject of each individual state of E. Yeah. So that, sums, so that a bundle of tropes has tr uh, individual tropes that modify it in a particular way such that it has all the individual features of phenomenal unified state does not entail that that bundle has those states experienced as a as a unified whole yeah is that is that like does it have to do with the fallacy of composition yeah you could you could think of it that that way the the the, re, the real i mean yeah the, the main argument is that um i can i can be appeared to readily and i could be it can be you know so i can have these appearances of the redness of a painting the blueness of a painting um the um the depth dynamics of me standing with respect to the painting, um, the sort of tactile features of, you know, my feet on the floor. All, so I have all of these individual phenomenal states. Yeah. Um, and imagine that I have all of those at once. Mm -hmm. That is compatible with me not having one single state, which is of having them, experiencing the having of them all at once. Yeah. That's something that's a, a unified that's a unified state that's not reducible to the the bringing together of all those states okay yeah. so the idea is is that if the bundle um, is um, a bundle of modifier tropes each of them is does is not a mental state the the idea is that the bundle has the um, phenomenal unified state E in virtue of having all of E's se inseparable parts. Yeah. But that just says that to be in a phenomenal unified state E is to have all of these phenomenal states at one time. But not necessarily unified. But not phenomenal unified. Phenomenally. So that I have all these states at the same time is different than and does yeah. not entail that I experience 
having them all at the same time yeah. as one unified experience. Yeah. So it could just be like this cacophony of, of right. quality. Right. So oh, if yeah. I've got, so if they're modifier, if they're modifier tropes, that some bundle has all of these modifier tropes does not entail that the bundle experiences all of them together in yeah. one totalizing state. That's good. Okay. I got right. that one. going to be the case for all these different um, topologies. And there's yeah. deal, the details we work out there, but you know, I know we went like 40 minutes or so over time. Dude, so. This was good, man. It, it was tricky. This is maybe my hardest podcast I've ever done because a lot of it was new to me, but you did a good job of explaining it. Like I, I hope so, man. This is, I'll have to listen back because this was so good, but yeah. And this is, this was really huge. I, I, thanks so much for all your hard work and going through. Yeah. And, and I know you, you had to dumb it down a lot. And uh, for, for those listening, like when this book comes out, go get the book and, and check that out. Cause it's so much easier to write your ideas and have them. He's got all these great uh, different um, pictures and stuff like that too. So um, get, get the book, check it out. It's going to be huge. There's, there's so many arguments that you developed in there, which is unreal. Just the amount. I hope at least some of them work. Yeah. Well, you, you <laughs> no, I don't want to cut you off either too, because bef before we recorded, you said you wanted to ask some other questions. So I'm yeah. happy to stick around if you want to. Can, can, so I gotta, yeah, I gotta head out soon, but can we do like just quick rapid fire a couple? I'll try it. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's hard. Yeah. I know it's hard for you, especially coming off of your dissertation, everything. Um, the, the human person. Yeah. Um, so, so I don't want to ask you to comment too much on another philosopher, right? But, but Swinburne talks about like the personhood being developed in utero. And so it's not like, like life begins at conception, but not personhood maybe. And he doesn't know along where it happens um, without having to like, you know, take shots at him or anything. What, what do you, does human personhood begin at conception for you? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't see any reason to think that that personhood doesn't begin at conception. Okay. Because if you think of, so the, the thought there is that um, persons um, have um, mental, you know, the di a difference between something that's merely biologically alive and something that is a person is that it's got some sort of mental life. Yeah. Or the capacities for a mental life. That is huge, yeah. Um, you might think, and and I don't see why there's a re not a re I don't see what reason there is to think that the zygote that forms initially at conception does is not imbued with the powers or capacities to be conscious that can only be realized um, when there's a certain level of neural complexity or something. Yeah, I, so I, I don't see a good reason to think that 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 it that personhood wouldn't start at conception. Okay, I'm with you on that. I like that. I think maybe and that too. If the emergentist doesn't have a reason to think that either, unless they're going to going to say that it's otherwise they'll have a sororities problem. Look, I have to have a hundred right. parts in the right way to get this emergent thing. Exactly. No, why isn't there an emergent law that just says when you get a zygote, you've got the powers, um, the capacities to be a per, uh, to be conscious that are that are necessary or sufficient and sufficient for being a person? Yeah, and a panpsychist should never ever argue against that because they believe it works, you know? <laughs> right, right, right. right. Yeah, yeah. They just say that the combination of those things is insufficient, but that seems arbitrary. Yeah. Um, so this whole time I've been wanting to ask you about like, like uh, the Kant's transcendental unity of apperception. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you're a host, host guy and that's where you, you spend a lot of your time. Have you, have you looked into that? Is, is, is Kant saying the same thing about phenomenal uh, consciousness or is that something different? So, so yeah, so he calls these, this, this, this argument, these, the arguments that I'm, um, um, so some people would call the kinds of arguments that I'm giving, you know, an Achilles type argument because Kant calls these kinds of arguments, the Achilles heel, heel of rationalism. Okay. He thinks that there does have to be a single um, subject of phenomenally unified consciousness, but he thinks that that is something, um, but he doesn't think that you can get at it through these. You can't know it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which, awful. It's a transcendental. It's a presupposition you have to have in place, but it's not yeah. something you can know. It's in the noumenal. So um, um, then going off your view then, so is, we've talked about this a little bit in a, in a uh, previous episode, but is, Knowledge of the self presupposed in 
in all of our thinking or is it something that that just comes along with all of our our thinking and knowledge yeah so i take it that if some if um something is presupposed uh, if something is merely presupposed you know some proposition is merely presupposed then that proposition isn't going to um we're not going to have um access to the evidence for that proposition oh okay right so um it has to be something that i just assume in order in order for something else to be the case um i don't have direct evidence for it my evidence for it is that if it wasn't there then i couldn't have this other thing that seems obviously there yeah, yeah so like an indirect argument kind of yeah right right but i think that we do have direct evidence of the self and that is in my ex and in that's part of this dual intentionality that I mentioned of in every experience that I have to some degree greater or lesser, there's going to be this experience of me being the one having the experience. Okay. And the self is just going to be the thing that, um, uh, that, that you predicate these propositions of as the experiencer of, you know, a tr the experiencer of the, having the experience of being appeared to truly or readily or, yeah. Parker. Yeah. Okay. So, so this whole time we we've kind of just danced a little bit around substance dualism and because we've been arguing against uh, opposing views, but um, on a substance dualist view, which, you know, I, I, I am one, I'm, you know, not, not as well reasoned through, but um, do you, do you have a mind or are you a mind? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That's really, that's good. If a mind, um, so I want to I want to say that um, I I don't want to say I am a mind. I want to say I am a minded thing. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, so I'm I am this myriologically simple that has that can be modified in various ways. And one of those ways that can be, it can be modified is by having mental states. Yeah. And so if you, if you think a mind just is a thing that has mental states, then yeah, you go, you can say I'm a mind. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I think that if, if mental states are modifications of substances, which I think that they are, then being, then I'm the thing that's minded. And that thing is a, is a fundamentally a, a person or essentially a person. Yeah, the person is is identical to the the um, very logically simple substance. Yeah, 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 substance. Okay, so because that, I am the things that has my thoughts. Yes, I like that. So that that I didn't think of that like distinction until I I was uh, I did a podcast episode on the extended mind thesis. Oh, and, cool. And it's interesting. I don't like totally buy it, but um, I thought you know that's a problem for me if I am a mind. But if I'm a substance uh, in a person, then my mind could be extended out into my thoughts or my journals. But, and and if I get a brain lesion that causes me not to remember those uh, or have access to them internally, I could still have access to those thoughts, which are my thoughts still from my journal. What, what, what do you think about that? Is that not part of my mind? My journals aren't my yeah, mind? I, I don't think that that can, because a journal, if it's a part of me, is a separable part. And so yeah, I think it's really part of me because the journal can remain what it is, um, even though it's not a part of me. So That's I wouldn't think that the journal is a part of me. So it can't be part of your mind. Yeah, it can't be a part of my mind. And mental states are modifications of a substance. And so, in some sense, they are inseparable parts of the substance of me. Yeah, dude, I got to do more work on myriology. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. So I don't. Yeah, I, I mean, EJ Lowe basically just says, look, philosophy is my philosophy of mind is in the trouble that it's in because it doesn't do ontology. That's what I talked with JP about. He said the same thing. Good. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah. Um, Lowe is one of uh, uh, JP's favorite um, philosophers and one of the most influential philosophers on his work. And, and, and obviously JP has been huge on, you know, my work along with Proust and others. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that that's exactly right we need to start doing more ontology and more phenomenology in a particular way yeah. for 
philosophy of mind to make the right sort of prog progress that he needs to make. I'm excited about that. I'm excited about some more uh, Husserl coming down the pike. And that, that sounds sweet. Um, one last thing I want to follow up on. You, you talked about uh, brain lesions and you brought out your brain in, in previous episodes. Um, and I, I think I know what you're going to say. But I can imagine someone listening to this and going, well, that actually proves, you know, physicalism because because the fact that you can have a brain lesion and not have uh, those memories anymore or not have the experience of, of redness anymore shows that, you know, you are your brain because you lost that capacity. And so, I, you know, um, yeah. as a dualist, I think we have reasons for that. But can you just explain? Yeah. So here's the empirical evidence. The empirical evidence is that when, um, let's say that I have damage to the V4 area of my brain and statistically, statistically correlated with damage to the V4 area of the brain leads to a diminish or a complete loss of color perception. Mm -hmm. That's the empirical data. So what is entailed by that? Well, it can't be that I'm identical to my brain. Why? Well, because it's, that's, it's um, equally accounted for by thinking that my visual perception is causally dependent on V4 of my brain. That, that, that's all the, that's the, that's what empirical evidence tells us, but that's completely compatible with substance dualism. If you think that the brain is, um, the sort of thing that's required for the, the soul or the substance, the self, to have color perception. Yeah. So, so it doesn't seem to me that that evidence, um, because it's underdetermined, because it can be equally accounted for by the, by the dualist, tells us anything about physicalism or dualism. Yeah. But what would, if my argument runs the case, is that um, if my argument works, then the area V4 can't be the subject of visual perception and it, because it's got separable parts that, that scatter the phenomenal state. And it also can't be the thing that plays a constitutive role in the brain being the subject of a phenomenal unified state, which includes um, co uh, color perception. So I don't think that the empirical data gives us anything that, um, let, let, let me think about it. So here, here's another way to think about. So, so yeah, let me finish that thought. Um, so the empirical evidence doesn't r run one way or the other. Unless you make this sort of assumption, and I think that this is the assumption in the background, and that's that if substance dualism is true, then the brain is irrelevant to experiences because it's the it's the simple self, the subject that has experiences. Yeah. But that is not a thesis that any dualist that I am aware of holds, even Descartes. I mean, right. it's not a surprise. I mean, the weird thing is, is that mo much of neuroscience is merely confirming things that we already knew. Mm -hmm. So look, we already knew that if people get bashed in um, the head in a particular part of their skull, it damages a particular part of their brain and they lose some sort of cognitive fun function. Yeah. We've known that for, you know, you know, 2000 years or more. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a new fact. We just knew, knew it with, we now know it with more um, specific uh, uh, details. Substance dualists have never thought that um, you that perception is not causally linked to the brain um, when you're embodied. Some hold that you can have those perceptions when you're disembodied. Yeah. But that's compatible with the thesis that when you are embodied, you're causally dependent on the features of the brain to give you perceptual states. Yeah. So, so um, following up on that, I, I wonder, JP said some stuff that was, I just, maybe I hadn't thought about before, but like I get hit in the head, I lose some memories. And then I die, and I'm a substantial soul. Those memories uh, are still there, but I just didn't have access to them before. Or did I actually lose those memories in my like in my actual substance? Yeah, good. So, so this this is going to get into, or I would suspect that in order to answer this question, it's going to have to get into the metaphysics and ontology of of of, of what a body is, mm -hmm. what a brain is. 
Okay. And on the view that I am sympathetic towards and the view that, that JP really advocates for, um, it's a sort of neo Aristotelian type view. And that's that what a body is, is a site is a, um, ensouled entity. Mm -hmm. So a body is not a merely physical thing. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, people want to say that. That's why a dead, a dead body is a corpse, not a dead body. Exactly. Right. Yeah. The, a, a, a body without a soul is not a body. It's a corpse. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so some people want to say, look, um, you know, JP is not really a substance dualist. Why? Well, because on his view, the body is not a substance that's separable from the soul. Hmm. You know, if that's the case, then many people we've called substance dualists aren't really substance dualists. Yeah. I don't care what you call it, but this is a type of psychophysical dualism. The, the, the subject of consciousness is a simple subs substance. A body is a way that the simple substance is modified, which includes a complex arrangement of physical um, properties. Yeah. So you might think then that in order that what having memories, uh, the ontology of a me memory is a modification of a simple subject that includes um, embodiment. Mm -hmm. So if you either, so if you're disembodied, you can't have access to your memories because what memories are, are embodied things. Ooh, okay. That's interesting. Yeah. So no, I'm not saying that that's, I'm not defending that thesis. I'm just saying that that's a plausible thesis for the substance dualist. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. But do you, do you think that? I don't know what I think about that. I mean, in the dissertation, and I'm, I'm not sure if this is going to make it into the, to the book is that um, the book I think is probably just going to be about, you know, against naturalistic theories of subjects. Um, but the natural, you know, the, 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 the immediate criticism for dualism is going to be, look, you argue that, that subjects of consciousness can't ha have separable parts, but the body, obviously I have a body and that's a part of me yeah. and it's a separable part. I can lose parts of it all the time. You know, uh, the biologists are correct. Then the body that I have right now is not the body I had when I was a toddler because it's made up of totally different parts. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, so I want to say, well, maybe, yeah, maybe on some views um, of substance dualism or even Thomism, um, uh, my body is a separable part. Um, that's going to be a problem. But on this view where a body is a psychophysical entity, it's not a separable part. It's in. It's an inseparable part mm -hmm. because it doesn't um, function when it's removed. Right. Right. Once the body. Um, uh, or sorry, once the soul is no longer embodied, then you don't have a body. Just like the hand being removed. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So that, that's why I call this a type like a bodily soul view. Yeah. Because um, uh, so these are bodily souls. These are souls that are that when they're embodied are modified in a particular way. Yeah. And so this actually gives I want to say like a more sophisticated and robust theory of unity between body and soul than the physicalist could ever have. Yeah. So back to the questions that you had about, you know, Christian physicalists, theologians often cite scripture as telling us that a that the human person is a unified is a single unified entity. And I want to say, yeah, that's true, but guess what? If that's true, then phys Christian materialism is is going to have a much more difficult time or if I'm correct in these arguments, it cannot yeah. give a a person as a deeply unified substance. Yeah a deeply unified person, but this substance dualism view definitely secures that. Wow. That's huge, man. That's so, so good. Yeah. It's all like coming together for me now, but that I really after, like after two books are done. I, I do want to write um, a book that's, that's, that's on, you know, philosophy of mind and consciousness for theologians. Yeah. Um, and it'll take some of my, already published essays and some new work and put, put them, put them in there together. Cause I think, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't really blame a lot of, a lot of the theologians um, because th they're not philosophers or neuroscientists and they're not, many of them are, are not studied in these, in these things. And they just got bad conceptions of substance dualism. So yeah. I think if we get the conceptions out on the table and get a fair hearing, then they're going to realize 
that this view is not as in, is is not as implausible as they once thought. Yeah. Pro- yeah. Dude, that's that's so you're writing so many books. I can't wait for the uh the modifier trope for a toddler's book. That's gonna be a really good one where you just Yeah. Yeah. Children about modifier tropes and Yeah. <laughs> be really good. <laughs> There's this funny story that JP has told. I, I know he's told it in class. Maybe he's told it other places too, but he t- he's talking to, with his kids. I don't know how old they were, but it sounds like they were really young about this. And he's like, you know what? You actually don't see me and mom. Hmm. You see our bodies. I don't know. I know his daughters, um, Ashley and Allison. I know Ashley a little bit better. And I don't think that they're like psychologically harmed by that, but <laughs> it's pretty rough. Right. So I don't know what kind of book I'd write on, you know, you don't really see mommy. I do <laughs> have a popular level talk and maybe I'll write a popular level book or something called uh, You Are Not Here. And it just has a picture of a brain with an arrow at yeah. it. You Are Not Here. So maybe you could do a kid's book that way. I have not, I don't know. That's awesome. I still want to do that book that I mentioned called Rage Against the Machine. Yes, you have to do that one. Yes. So I wanted to title my dissertation that, but I don't think people would have, I don't think they would have allowed me to. The millennials would have got it. Yeah. Yeah. Alex, <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't think, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe not. Well, dude, um, seriously, this has been so huge. I feel like I've, I've leveled up uh, a couple levels here. Still got to chew through a lot of this. Um, thanks sure. so much for, for all your time. You've given us hours. Oh yeah, man. I love your podcast. I love the demeanor in which you do it in philosophy in particular is way too depersonalized and way too combative. And so the fact that you are transparent about being a person and treat your, your guests as people and that you showcase your curiosity about things makes your podcast, um, really unique and important. And when, why I thought it was, you know, I'd be happy to share my time with you. So it's because of who you are, Parker, and how that's showing up in your podcast that wow. made me want to give my time. So that's that's so huge. Even though you can't see me, do you still say those nice things? Yeah. I mean, technically, I don't see. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. And, and then a couple different levels here. Yeah. Trent Merrick says this argument against dualism where he says, look, um, if dualism is true, I don't kiss my wife. I just kiss her lips. But I obviously kiss my wife. So substance dualism is false. Is that a good argument? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, this this has been awesome, Brandon. Like, I, I hope um, in in the spring we can get you back on when you're done. Well, maybe you won't be done yet, but but when you add some more time, man, I'd love to talk more philosophy of mind. I think it's so important. And I think fun. one of the most important uh, dudes right now working in this field at a high level um, with Christian convictions, which is just awesome. It's awesome. Thank so you. I'm encouraged you. by you, man, and. Uh, if, for those listening, if you're kind of considering going into the philosophy of mind, go into the philosophy of mind, go learn about it. Come on my podcast. We'll talk about it all day. Um, this has been awesome. Uh, Brandon, thanks again, man. So this has been. Well, also, I'll, br- I'll briefly mention too. I'm sorry. If uh, I've mentioned my publications, I think you can get every single one of them on my website. Yeah, I saw that. man. Brandon So yeah. if you want to download those, they're there for free. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Check out his name in the uh, description or right there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, spell it correctly. Yeah, there's there's a whole wealth of information there. Um, so looking forward to that book coming out, man. Thanks. Yeah, or all the books that we mentioned on here coming out. Yeah. Well, um, we could talk about this more, but we've given you guys like four or five hours, so that's going to have to do it. Um, this has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God. <laughs>